<laughs> so great to have you here. So I think it's free and we will just um, keep in time. And I'm very happy to welcome the audience to the Industrial Symposium um, for Associates of Cape Cod um, on rapid to low um, patient sample number one pre beta DQ contesting the fungal stat experience. So of course we all know that you know PTTQ can is a can be a very useful test if used in the right context and if you know used in the, used in the right patient population and especially if, if the results are interpreted the right way. Um, and yeah, one of the big drawbacks has always been that there has not been a single sample testing available. And it was always kind of like you needed to run these ELISAs with multiple sample testing, so it was not as useful for rapid diagnostic and for diagnostics in smaller hospitals. But there's some news um, and I'm news and new applications of this test and I'm very excited um, today to moderate this symposium and um, also introduce now the first speaker, um, which will be Jürgen Health, um, the Congress organi organizer from Erlangen in Germany. Um, and he will talk about um, the fungal stat in invasive fungal diseases and implications for the microbiological laboratory. So Jürgen has a long experience in working with biomarkers, including Peter Tichlukan, and I'm very excited um, to hear about his experience here. Jürgen, please take it away. Okay, thanks for the opportunity um, to uh, speak in this industrial symposium. Thanks to Associates of Cape Cod. I will now try to share my, my screen, and uh, you please give me a feedback if you can see it. And you yes. can hear me? See it yes. fine. We can hear you. We can see you. This the screen. Okay, great. So um, everybody who knows me uh, knows also that um, uh, beta D glucan is my diagnostic baby, and uh, since more than ten years, I'm uh, working with it in um, in studies and also in uh, routine. Um, and I will try to give you some insights um, from me on the uh, fungitella say the fungitella status say, and what it what uh, it means for the microbiological my, microbiological oh, sorry, laboratory. So these are my disclosures. Um, as you all know, um, beta 13 glucan or BDG is part of the fungal cell wall, and uh, in the middle part of the fungal cell wall, there are the the glucans uh, beta 16 and beta 13 glucan. In the outer part, there is are, are more the manans and the manoproteins, and, and in the in the inner area, there is the chitin layer. So um, manan, you also know, um, is used for um, detection of uh, candida species, but the glucans um, they are uh, more or less uh, panfungal. So uh, without uh, with some ex exceptions, they are detecting a large um, a large amount of different fungal species. They are abundant in Pneumocystis, in Candida, in Aspergillus, and Fusarium. So, for the uh, most uh, frequent um, uh, fungal uh, pathogens, they are able to be detected with 1,3-beta-D-glucan. Uh, and also, um, uh, fungi that are not that prevalent in, in Europe, but are prevalent in other parts of the world, like coxi or histoplasma. Um, they are also uh, elevated in, in patients with these infections. Um, one free glucan is scarce in uh, Cryptococcus and it's absent in the mucoralis. That means um, um, infections by mucoralis can't be detected by uh, that one free beta glucan. Um, in my opinion, uh, BDG is currently the most sensitive fungal serum biomarker. This is a quote by me and um, based on my experience, um, it has an excellent sensitivity in pneumocystis uh, pneumonia with um, an, a sensitivity of nearly 100 percent. And it's um, it's better than its competitor like the LDH that can be measured in serum in patients with uh, PCP which has a sensitivity of 86%. Also in patients with candidemia, it has a very good sensitivity BDG of nearly 90%. And Manan, uh, for example, um, has a very um, uh, lower uh, sensitivity of about 60%. 
And um, what is true for PCP and candidemia is, in my opinion, also true for invasive pulmonary aspergillosis, where the sensitivity of BDG is around between 70 and 80 percent, and the galactomannan sensitivity from serum, not from BAL, is um, significantly lower. So what is the reason for this? The reason is that the amount of BDG that is released by the fungal infections is different. What we can measure in the serum, the concentrations are very high in pneumocystis pneumonia with a median of 800 picogram per ml. Um, for comparison, the, the cutoff of the fungital, the classical fungital assay is 80 picograms per ml. So we have a, um, a median uh, BDG concentration that is 10 times above the cutoff. In candidemia, this is um, uh, the, the median BDG concentration is lower, around 400 picograms per ml, and in aspergillosis, it's 200 picograms per ml. And this is the reason why the sensitivity of these fungal infections um, uh, or the sensitivity of BDG in these fungal infections is uh, different. Um, a major point of criticism about uh, the fungitella say and the measurement of BDG is that it only has a moderate specificity. And this is true, it doesn't have a specificity of 100%. And um, in real life, the specificity is probably even a little lower than in these uh, numbers I have here that are coming from studies. Specificity is good or very good in, in pneumocystis pneumonia. It's um, less good in candida and aspergillus infection, around um, 80 to 85%, I would say. What are the reasons for, these, uh, for this moderate specificity? If you look into the literature, you, fin you will find numerous um, explanations and uh, factors that uh, are supposed to, to, to um, um, to lead to elevated BDG levels in the in the serum. However, most of these uh, factors like antibiotics, antimycotics, um, uh, different bacteremias, and the fractionated blood products in all kinds of, of ways, um, most of the data is, is just an indirect, there is a, a correlation. So, uh, for example, uh, patients that had piperacillin uh, tazobactam therapy, they had more often um, elevated BDG levels, but uh, in only very few of them, you have the data that shows a direct uh, causing effect. And um, if you look for these uh, proven sources of uh, false positive or elevated BDG levels, uh, the number is uh, reduced. We know that dialysis with cellulose membranes, which are normally in, in, in most patients, they are not used. Uh, lead to elevated BDG levels. Major surgeries is a problem in the three days, four days after major surgeries, BDG is elevated. Definitely uh, are intravenous immunoglobulins and albumin causing elevated BDG levels. Um, so we have a, 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 some issues with false positivity. However, however, if you look at other uh, biomarkers that are used in infectious diseases, like uh, like PCT or C CRP. Um, I mean, they are used every day, but um, the specificity is not be better. PCT, for example, you use it for a diagnosis of pneumonia or sepsis, and it's also positive in trauma and tumor after surgery in, uh, in, in certain autoimmune diseases, and it is elevated in drug fever, or even uh, more pronounced the C-reactive protein which is elevated after trauma in tumor patients, after surgery, in autoimmune disease, after uh, cardiac infection, or uh, simply in, in, other non, uh, in other sterile inflammations. And specificity, for example, of the C-reactive protein in sepsis is 65%. That means it's much less than, uh, for example, BDG. What I want to say is that the specificity of BDG is not that bad. Um, Okay, um, <clears throat> so how could we use uh, BDG in uh, clinical practice? I mean, for um, fungal infections, there's um, one of the first uh, approaches was the screening of the patient. So every patient one, two or three times per week gets a measurement, um, although he does not have any symptoms. 
Uh, if the biomarker is positive, this would either lead to uh, preemptive therapy or would um, uh, trigger further diagnostic tests like a CT or a BAL. And then you could use other biomarkers to uh, ensure that um, the patient has um, an invasive fungal infection. And if the biomarker is negative, everything is fine. So uh, how is it uh, with the screening, for example, in invasive aspergillosis? Um, if you just do a simple like, mathematical calculation and you have, for example, 1,000 patients with, uh, with an AML um, and you have within these patients um, an incidence of about 5% uh, of patients who will get an invasive aspergillosis, you will come up with 50 um, patients uh, with invasive aspergillosis. If you perform a screening, um, a galactomanan screening on these patients, and um, I used uh, these, um, these um, diagnostic performance um, um, numbers from, um, uh, from a, a large um, meta-analysis, uh, then you will, would come up with 35 true positive patients with a sensitivity of 71%, but also with 110 false positive patients with a specificity of um, around 90%. So, which means that um, you have three times more fast positive results um, in, with galactomanan screening than true positive patients. And this is something um, we also know now from, from COVID-19. It's just if you have, a, um, if you have a, a disease that has a very low uh, prevalence, um, then you will get a lot of fast uh, positive um, results. We also, um, had a look at this a uh, couple of years back uh, at the University of Freiburg, uh, where we examined uh, over one year, 91 patients after stem cell transplantation under antifungal prophylaxis, which means um, the number of uh, invasive fungal diseases are, um, <clears throat> are low. And we screened them once weekly, so we performed 516 galactomanan tests, and we had 18 positive uh, tests, uh, that means 3% of the samples were positive in 10 patients, which means uh, in 11% of the patients. That is the, the, the ratio from negative galactomanan to positive galactomanan was 28 to 1. And uh, these 489 negative galactomanan tests would have cost um, the, the, the clinic uh, 4,500 euros. So, I mean, each clinic has to decide if, if this approach is reasonable. I think the screening approach is not the right one. I would use markers or biomarkers like BDG with a symptom-driven um, approach. And then you have like two choices how to do this. Either you do a, a positive predictive approach, which means um, you have a patient with symptoms, you uh, measure the biomarker. If it's positive, you start the therapy. And if it's negative, you start no therapy. And then there is another approach um, which uh, uses the high negative predictive value of uh, beta D-glucan, which means as soon as the patient has, has symptoms, you start the therapy and afterwards you, um, you do the measurement. And if the biomarkers are negative, then you stop the therapy. And if they are positive, you continue the therapy. And this is probably the approach that is um, most uh, favored by uh, or favored by many clinicians at the moment and also microbiologists. Is it really necessary to do a symptom driven testing or is empirical therapy um, uh, sufficient? The, the, the slide you see shows also data from uh, the University of Freiburg um, where we had a look into the time point of the start of antifungal therapy in patients with candidemia. And um, for you have like this timeline and um, the, the drawing of the first blood cultures are probably um, um, equal to the, the time point of the first symptoms of the patient. Um, you send the blood cultures to the microbiology lab. We incubate them. They get positive. We do a gram stain out of these bottles. And if we if we see something in the gram stain, we, we uh, give a phone call to the clinician and discuss the therapy with him. And um, in our cohort in, in Freiburg over these two years, there were 12% of the patients who were already on antifungal prophylaxis, so they had 
um, a breakthrough infection and they were mostly hematologic oncology patients. And um, only 4% of the patients got the antifungals at the time when they had their first symptoms, this means when they uh, had the blood culture samplings. Most of the patients, nearly 50%, every second patient got the antifungal when the microbiologist phoned the doctor in the clinic and said, the patient doesn't have bacteria in his blood, he has yeast in his blood. And even, even um, more um, uh, surprising is that 20% didn't get um, an antifungal um, even um, after we uh, told them that there are yeast in the blood culture because the doctors, I don't know, they thought it's a contamination or whatever. Together, it's two thirds of the patients that um, receive their antifungals after two to three days after the drawing of the first blood cultures, which means when the blood cultures are positive. And that's not good because we learned that um, the, a delay in the start of the antifungal treatment is um, has an effect on hospital mortality and you should start your antifungals early. So you need something um, that tells you faster than blood culture that, for example, you have candidemia. And biomarkers could be those um, could be those, some uh, in, uh, diagnostic um, um, mean. Let's change a little bit to um, the fun fungital assay. Um, as probably most of you know, the fungital assay uses um, the um, limulus uh, amoebocyte um, lysid cascade. Um, this is like an ancient immune system of the horseshoe crab, um, and you use the, the lymph uh, liquid of the horseshoe crab to detect either LPS or glucan. And um, in, in the fungital assay, the LPS arm um, is uh, inactivated, which uh, leaves you only with a glucan induced arm of this uh, coagulation cascade which leads at the end to a, um, to a, a color reaction um, that you can detect with a, a normal uh, a photometer. Um, the, the workflow of the classical fungital assay is that uh, you, um, you um, pipette serum together with a pretreatment solution in a 96 well plate, you incubate it for um, 10 minutes at 37 degrees, you add the um, fungital reagent, which means that's the, the, the limulus reagent, and then you do a kinetic measurement over 40 minutes at 37 degrees Celsius, and you get a kinetic of um, the color that develops uh, within the, the wells. And by a, by a mathematical uh, progress, you get um, a, a concentration out of this. Now, the problem is that you need, uh, in, the, in the classical fungital assay, um, a standard curve and the standard curve consists of um, five standards in duplicate and a negative control, which means 12 of the wells and 12 times the uh, expensive lull reagent is not wasted, but is used on the on the standards. And if you use one vial of this lull reagents, uh, you're able to measure the standards and 42 cavities in duplicate, which means 21 patients within one test run, and that uh, gives you a, a cost of 25 euros per sample. Now, um, if you want to, like, if, if you if you do such an approach uh, in in earlier years, we would have done one um, measurement weekly, which uh, is is. Um, is, which means that, that you have, uh, have a lot of uh, uh, time delay until you get the results. If you want to test more frequently, like you do three test runs per week, you need the standard curve each time um, and um, you could measure less uh, samples because uh, the LAL reagent, LAL reagent is used on the, uh, on the, on the standards. Um, if you do this like it is, um, you would come up with um, 36 cavities with standards and negative controls and only eight cavities with the samples, which means you use double the 
uh, amount of uh, lull reagent uh, on the on the on the standards and controls and not on the on the samples and you would uh, be able to measure nine samples and that's the price of 60 euros per sample. So for most of the clinicians at our hospitals, this would be too expensive. So we um, did, um, 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 we, we changed a little bit uh, our workflow and we came up with um, a workflow that we uh, measured the standard once a week, like on Monday, and um, we used for the uh, for the remaining test runs in this week or for this uh, lull reagent, we used um, the same standard curve and we had standards and negative controls that we used in each test run and they had to be similar um, to the one measured at the beginning with the standards and uh, this would um, uh, enable us to um, measure more samples and this means we, we were able to, to do three test runs per week um, we were, we were able to uh, measure 16 samples and that's uh, a price of 31, 35 euros per sample, which was okay for our clinicians. Now, um, money matters. So the frequency of testing depends on the number of samples. Uh, that is something uh, for sure. And uh, we in Erlangen, um, we have a, a 1,400 beds hospital and we get approximately five samples per day. Which means, with our um, with our um, with our approach, we were able to test three times per week. And in the last years, we got a, a lot of um, uh, samples from external senders. Which means we have another uh, mean of five samples per day. Um, so at the moment, we are able to um, to perform uh, everyday testing with the classical fungi telesy. But this is not the case for other labs who have less samples, and they won't be able to use the classical fungi telesa, um, or they would pay uh, an enormous amount of money per sample. So you can send us our samples, but this is also coming with a disadvantage because our standard mail in Germany um, delivers us the, the serum samples within a mean of three days. But as you can see here, uh, some are uh, quite long on their way to us. Um, and, and, and that's also um, uh, a problem. So it would be better to have uh, a system to measure BDG in every lab. Um, one such a system um, is, uh, um, is used in Graz, so they have a blood co coagulation analyzer that measures um, daily and um, without uh, time loss uh, beta D glucan samples within 45 minutes. But you need the machine, the blood correlation analyzer, needs somebody to um, to validate all this, and that's uh, is something most uh, labs won't have. And therefore, um, I was very happy to hear that um, when Markham uh, Finkelman told me that uh, now the fung fungital stat assay is available on the market. The fungital stat assay is an assay um, that is able to do single sample or small series testing. Uh, its competitor, the Fujifilm Waco test, is um, almost similar. It comes with a uh, predefined um, standard curve, so you don't have any standards to measure. Um, so the cost in the, in the Waco test is independent of the number of uh, samples you measure. In comparison, the, the, the Fungital Stat assay uses one, um, one control, and then you can measure one to seven um, samples uh, within one test run, which makes the um, or which which uh, is that the costs are also nearly independent uh, of the number of samples. So both um, systems enable you to to perform single sample testing or testing of small series. To um, evaluate the uh, diagnostic performance of the fungi tell stat assay, um, we did um, a study on three patient populations. We had um, 150 patients with uh, blood culture proven candidemia and 50 control patients with bacteremia negative blood cultures. 
We also had 47 patients with invasive aspergillosis for proven and 43 probable cases. And uh, we examined uh, 63 patients with pneumocystis pneumonia um, in our study. So the results for the candidemia patients um, uh, are shown on this slide. What you can see is um, we, we first did an ROC analysis to see how the optimal cutoff levels uh, for the three assays. We compared uh, the Fungital Classic assay, the Fungital Stat assay, and the Fujifilm Waco um, beta glucan test were. And uh, it was um, very nice that the um, optimal cutoffs we um, determined for the Fungital assays were almost um, identical to the, the one the manufacturer um, um, recommends. In contrast, and that is something that is known for the Fujifilm Waco test, the optimal cutoff um, for the Fujifilm Waco test was um, much lower than the one um, recommended by the manufacturer. And this one with seven picogram was already lowered from 11 picogram uh, this year. Um, the sensitivity and specificity of the uh, classical fungital assays um, or the classical fungital assay and the fungital stat assay in candidemia patients was nearly identical, a little above 90%, and also the specificity was nearly identical, around 65%. In, in, in uh, comparison, the Fujifilm Waco test had a much lower sensitivity at both cutoffs, um, for 57 for the manufacturer cutoff and 64% for our optimized cutoff. However, the, the, the specificity was much higher with the Fujifilm Waco test. The comparison of the ROC curves or the area under the ROC curves showed that the fungital assays were, had a significantly higher uh, um, area under the ROC curve comparison to the Waco test. And also the results we had, uh, we received from both fungital assays, they showed a very nice significant correlation. And these results um, were also um, uh, the case for uh, invasive aspergillosis. It's, um, it's, it's uh, as I said in the beginning, the sensitivity is lower in invasive aspergillosis. So the fungital assays uh, showed a sensitivity between 75 and 80 percent. The Fujifilm Waco test sensitivity between 55 and 65 percent. And in uh, pneumocystis pneumonia, um, we have excellent sensitivities because of the high beta glucan levels in the blood of 100% for the fungital assays and between 90 and 95% for the Fujifilm Waco test. Again, um, the, both the, the, the classical fungital assay and the fungital stat assay, um, the results show very good correlation for uh, invasive aspergillosis and pneumocystis pneumonia patients. Uh, with this, I will come to my conclusions. Um, in my opinion, and um, I probably most of the clinicians agree with this, uh, timely beta 13 glucan measurement is desirable. Um, and this is achievable with a, with a classic fungital assay. If you have enough samples, you can test per day. Five samples per day gives you, um, lets you, uh, enables you to test around three uh, samples per week, and um, you can increase the, frequ the frequency of the testing if you have more samples. An alternative, if you have less samples, is uh, you buy uh, an expensive blood coagulation analyzer, you do the validation, and then you can test daily, or um, you uh, go for the Fujifilm Waco uh, beta glucan test or the Fungital Stat assay, both enable single sample or small series testing. However, the Fungital Stat assay. Um, Oh, wait, um, the, the, fung the fungital assays show a similar diagnostic performance to each other, so the fungital stat assay is as good as the fungital classic assay. The results show a strong correlation. Both the fungital assay have a superior sensitivity compared to the Fujifilm Waco beta glucan test in all patient groups. And our uh, conclusion at the end is that the new fungital stat assay combines the single sample testing with a high sensitivity of the classical fungital assay. And uh, with this, I'm finished and I'm happy to uh, answer your questions. Thanks, Thanks so much. So much.
for an excellent presentation. So now I need to stop, I think, my sharing. No? Yeah, and then here, yeah, I, 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 I just. Is it now better? So I can see you. Perfect. I just hear an echo that it must have to do, but now it's much better, I think. Great. So are there any questions for Jürgen Held? I don't see one in the chat, so just as a housekeeping issue, you can post your questions in the chat, but you can also, I think, ask them. Unmute yourself and ask them right away. Um, I do have one question. In terms of cutoff, what is kind of like the optimal cutoff um, in terms of sample numbers between using the stat essay? Is Erlangen switching now to the stat essay or are you staying with the traditional ELISA? Um, and what is the cutoff, the proposed cutoff when to use which one, basically number of samples per week um, or samples per day actually, because you can test more often, right? So. So um, no, uh, in Erlang we don't switch to the Fungitas stat essay, but that's not uh, because we we think the Fungitas stat essay is as a as a lower diagnostic performance. We don't switch to it because we have enough samples to um, perform daily testing with the classical Fungitas essay. And um, if you have enough samples, the the hands-on time um, per sample is lower with the classical Fungitas essay. However, if you want to um, offer your um, clinicians a reasonable uh, time to result, uh, and if you just have like, let's say, less than five samples per week, um, that's something where I would say you have to go for the, um, the fungi test stat assay. Or even if you, if you want to um, uh, offer daily testing with five samples per day, that would be the same. Yeah, I think it's a very important point. So in Graz, as shown, we have the coagulation automat and it's actually running um, in, the in, in, in the laboratory medicine, right? So that's kind of like it's often the problem because you need to have laboratory medicine doing serological tests, which is not always working out. And that's kind of like where you have to kind of like organize it because it's really expensive to buy one of these coagulation automats just for the test. Um, yeah, so I think, but of course, I think it has to be highlighted that, you know, if you use it for antifungal sewer chip or so, or for discontinuation of truck, um, you want to have frequent testing, right? And as you said, if you don't have enough samples for daily testing, then it may make sense to use this dead assay because at the same time, you will also, you need more hands on, on time basically for doing the test, but then you, but then you will save also a lot of time for, um, a, a lot of money for antifungals. So, I see another question maybe coming in. I think Louis White uh, has. Uh, oh, yeah. Louis, please go ahead. Just waiting for things to come, come on to life. Um, yes, just to confirm what you're both saying, really, because um, in Wales, in Cardiff, we're the reference lab for all of Wales. There's a population of about three and a half million um, and around sort of six or seven other large hospitals to which we provide the BAD glucan testing. So, on a normal non-COVID week, we're probably doing five runs a week around sort of 15 samples or 20 samples a day. But what we've noticed that, you know, even though it's a quite a small area, as Jürgen said, sometimes it can take three or four or five days, even longer for samples to come to you. So we're in the situation where what we're looking to do is it doesn't make sense for us to, to use the stat assay. It's easier for us to run the original fungitel test because the numbers we've got and it's easier to do it. But we're potentially going down a route of what we would call a, a hub and spoke system, where some of the district general hospitals with you know with slightly higher numbers, requ higher requests for BTD glucan would take on board the stat assay. And if they require then confirmation, they send it on to us. And that's the way we're looking to potentially introduce it. Yeah. It's that's also awesome, also my experience, and that the the post problem is really um, it's it's difficult. It's not in most cases it's not the post uh, uh, like the, the the post itself. It's the time until the sample gets from the clinician into the parcel on the in the post office, and then it's normally delivered within one or two days. But uh, in, at at some universities or larger hospitals, it just takes three to four days until. It's it's sent away from the university, and that's yeah. I think unacceptable. Yeah. Thanks a lot. I don't see any more questions for now, but we can have some discussion also at the end of the session, and I think. And I'll now introduce um, Louis White, um, who is 
heading the National Refer Fungal Reference Lab um, in Wales, uh, in Cardiff, um, and will talk specifically about the fungal stat, fungal stat performance in critical care patients, and also including um, um, COVID-19 patients with acute respiratory failure. Looking forward to your talk, Louis. Thank you, Martin. Hopefully now you can see my screen, which says fungal stat performance in critical care patients. Martin, yes, can you confirm? Can. Yes, Wonderful. That's a great start. So it says including COVID-19. I can pretty much guarantee you it's going to include entirely COVID-19 patients. And we have done some additional work outside of the, the critical care COVID-19 patient, but I think it's still quite topical to sort of just focus on this cohort for now. OK, so background and Jürgen's done a fantastic job at, of already describing much of what, what I'm going to say on this slide. BDG is a major cell wall compound of many fungi, the exception being the mucarales and obviously the cryptococcus species. And I also think sort of blastomyces has limited amount of uh, BCG glucan in its cell wall. In terms of overall detection, it's been around for over two decades. Um, and when you look at meta-analyses, sensitivity and specificity average out somewhere around that 80% mark for both. Uh, for both uh, parameters. But in the situation, what we do find is that if you get sequential positivity for BTG glucan, you can drive that specificity up. And it has been proposed that we can use it for antifungal stratification. In the UK, we have the National Institute for Clinical Excellence, or NICE, and they've actually proposed that the Fungitel test be used where negativity can be used to, to exclude or stop antifungal therapy. Um, whether it's actually taken, been used in that way, um, it's difficult to say across the UK. It's certainly something that we would employ, and uh, we, we would use BTD glucan alongside other biomarkers to certainly prevent the use of unnecessary antifungals in our patients. As Jurgen has really nicely shown, that sort of large numbers are generally required for testing, um, and that's to reduce that cost because otherwise you end up using a lot of the main reagent on controls and, and standards rather than the actual clinical uh, clinical specimens. So subsequently, testing is focused on large institutions, generally reference or specialist facilities. And the other problem, again, Jürgen sort of highlighted this point, batch testing then increases the turnaround time, which limits clinical utility. Now, for us during the COVID-19 pandemic, this wasn't a problem. We actually went up to seven day a week testing, sometimes doing three or four runs per day. Just to highlight the fact that sort of um, during January in 2020, uh, which is the peak of the second wave in the UK, uh, we did somewhere in the region of around 900 BTD glucan tests in that month. In 2019, the year prior, obviously, we did somewhere in the region of about 120 BTD glucan tests. So significant demand for this testing during the COVID-19 pandemic. So generally, Outside of COVID-19, um, in the, sort of the normal, what we would classify as the district general hospital, where you're not a, you know, a reference or specialist facility, and um, we really want to try and improve accessibility to this test to improve turnaround time and subsequently improve, improve clinical utility. In other words, how the results impact on patient management. But that's driven by the fact that the, the performance of such tests need to be comparable with the, the previous version of the test. So we've seen this already. This is the Fungitel stat assay. Um, it's an adaptation of the original Fungitel uh, kit. It's FDA cleared and CE marked, and it's for used for looking for serum BTD glucan. Um, Jürgen didn't really mention it in his previous talk. One thing we would never recommend is BTD glucan tests of respiratory specimens, and the understanding that the respiratory tract is full of commensal, commensal organisms or colonizing fungi. So subsequently, you can get a lot of false positivity, more false positivity, if you look for BTD glucan in, in respiratory tract specimens. Now, unlike the precursor fungital assay, the STAT test only uses this one. Uh, standard or requires this one standard specimen. So it's doing away with the requirement for five standards and the negatives that are running duplicates. So using up a lot of main reagent. And so what happens is you, end, you do some pretreatment, alkaline pretreatment of your specimens, of your standard. When that's done after, after incubating for 30, 37 degrees, you then use that to resuspend your main reagent and you can test one to seven specimens in this small little PKF08 incubator. And this also reads the, the actual changes um, in turbidity and color in, in these basic in these samples. And it's, this is linked up to a PC that then generates the data um, in line with what we would normally see for sort of the original Fungitel tests. 
Turnaround time is in, in one hour, and gen, generally the results are sort of more qualitative in relation to the stat. Could be described as semi-quantitative in that you get this beta D glucan index, a BGI, where values less than 0.7 or equal to, to 0.774 or less are considered negative. In determinants, 0.75 to 1.1, and values at or greater than 1.2 are considered positive. So initial comparisons of this, this is work primarily done by the sort of associates of Cape Cod. And what they looked at was when you spiked uh, serum samples with known concentrations of beta-D-glucan, what did you get a proportional response with the, the fungi tail stat assay? And you can see here, we've got a good R, uh, Pearson's R, and a sort of highlighting that there's a proportional, a significant correlation between the D-glucan concentration and the, 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 in this case, the fungal stat rate. In relation to actual clinical specimens at this time, they looked at 488 patient specimens um, and looked at negative agreement, which is around 92%, and positive agreement, which is slightly less, around 83%. But what you can actually uh, see from both of these sort of, uh, or both of these sort of sample populations is that most of the discordance comes around the indeterminate results. And generally, in my experience, is that you generally see in something if it's sort of a low positive for glucan uh, using the fungi tail, it's going to potentially going to be indeterminate using the stat. And subsequently, if it's indeterminate using fungi tail, it'll likely be sort of uh, a strong negative, as we would call it, uh, using the stat assay. So overall agreement was around 86%. And as I said, most of sort of the discordant results involved the indeterminates. But again, a good correlation between the stat ratio and the fungi tail concentration. Um, and again, a significant Pearson's R. In terms of reproducibility, in the original study, they looked at five simulated serum samples. So these are serums containing known concentrations of beta D glucan. And they looked at 90 measurements at three centers over five days. And so what you found is that most of your positives actually were positive, which is what you actually want to see, uh, greater than 97% sort of uh, detection rates. And most of your negative samples actually remain negative. And this coefficient of variation here is typically what we would actually see, or is in line with what we would see with the original fungi tail glucan assay. So performance is looking consistent, um, reproducible between centers and between runs. And the, the variation or the within assay variation um, it's very similar to what we would actually normally see. So we decided that it would be good to perform an independent assay of the Fangital stat assay. Uh, and that was because of the situation of the COVID-19 pandemic and sort of the ongoing sort of requirement for sort of rapid results, quick turnaround time, and the delay of samples getting you know, to us from other laboratories. Uh, and to highlight this issue, um, there's one lab which is literally 12 miles west of us. And for them to get samples to, to us, they actually had to send samples another 25 miles further west. And then they actually traveled 37 miles east to come to us for testing. And so that meant we was like 48 hours before we actually received a sample, which initially was only 12 miles from us. And this just highlights the problem of getting samples between hospitals, which are reliant on existing uh, transport networks. And I think the other aspect we have to look at in terms of aspergillus in the ICU is, is, is actually a, sig a significant problem. But I think this is sort of data from the ASP ICU study, uh, looking at the drivers and impact of antifungal therapy um, in the intensive care patient, where aspergillus had already been recovered from an upper respiratory tract specimen. And what it actually shows us is that the main drivers of whether a patient actually receives antifungal therapy or not is basically their clinical presentation, the signs and symptoms, even if, is this, if this is non-specific in the form of say a, you know, a fever in a neutropenic patient that doesn't respond to antibacterials, um, whether they've got a host factor, an EORTC host factor, i.e. acute leukemia, allogeneic, stero uh, uh, allogeneic, allogeneic stem cell transplantation, or even the use of steroids. Um, and generally the severity of disease, I, how ill that patient is as indicated by SOFA score. And generally that sort of the more of these sort of clinical factors was uh, indicated the chance of this patient receiving antifungal therapy. And, and unfortunately, when it's sort of look at the drivers of CT and biopsy um, and bronchoscopy, it was these underlying clinical conditions that actually drived whether those tests were performed. And of course, when those tests are positive, 
most of those patients actually received antifungal therapies, which, which you would expect. These tests are highly sensitive. However, when these tests were negative, still over 50% of these patients went on to receive antifungal therapy. And that's because biopsy, CT and bronchoscopy, um, in a way, are not necessarily the most sensitive tests uh, for determining as invasive aspergillosis. So subsequently, there's sort of limited confidence in a negative result. And so that fear factor then drives the use of antifungals, even in the absence of, ev of evidence by these tests. And unfortunately, in this study, there was a low diagnostic uptake of tests that could have made a difference. Even BAL and CT were only performed in less than 50% of patients. And galactamine and PCR and BCD glucan were actually performed in a really small number of patients. But to show you what we're actually doing is it isn't really making a difference is that there was no difference in mortality in patients, whether they received antifungal therapy or not, whether they were deemed to be colonized or whether they were deemed to have invasive aspergillosis. And so the authors put forward that we needed to incorporate advances in the diagnosis of invasive pulmonary aspergillosis in the critical care patient. And of course, that led to sort of concerns in our sort of COVID-19 patient, um, primarily from the fact that we know that invasive influenza in the critical care patient can lead to high rates of invasive aspergillosis, secondary invasive aspergillosis. Approximately one in five patients on the, in, in critical care with influenza can go on to develop invasive aspergillosis. So we were concerned with the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic that we would actually see increased rates of invasive aspergillosis in the critical care COVID-19 patient. And rates, various rates have of aspergillosis have been reported, um, meta-analyses now, and through the availability of consensus criteria for defining um, invasive aspergillosis in the COVID-19 patient, given us an incidence somewhere around sort of the seven and a half to 10% mark. Um, but we're also seeing significant rates of COVID-19 associated candidiasis, um, and this is probably it sort of implies the fact that we have, you know, critical care colleagues working under immense pressure with a large number of complicated patients, and that leads then down to potential breakdown in infection control procedures or actually maintenance of sort of procedures that would limit invasive candidal disease. There's also concern that we were going to see um, COVID-19 associated pneumocystis pneumonia, given the fact that many of the COVID-19 patients develop lymphopenia, lymphopenia, and lymphopenia is a risk factor for PCP. Although there have been the odd case reported, I don't think it's as significant currently as aspergillosis, candidiasis, or even mucomycosis. Um, and possibly in the UK, we do use quite a lot of septrin to manage our patients presenting with ventilator-associated pneumonia or community-acquired pneumonia. So I'm wondering if this empirical use of septrin is knocking down the incidence of PCP. But I think from this perspective, BDG has the capacity to detect all of the, the um, invasive fungal diseases listed above, uh, plus other in, invasive fungal diseases, as Jürgen has already alluded to. Of course, differentiation can be difficult based on BTD glucan alone. So, so subsequently, you need to combine BTD glucan with other mycology. And what you can see over on the right is what we actually incorporated for the management of our critical care COVID-19 patients. And the minimum requirement was a blood culture uh, and a serum for BTD glucan testing. But ideally, this would be then combined with a BAL or non-directed bronchial lavage, which we perform culture, aspergillus PCR, galactamine, and ELISA, and a pneumocystis PCR. And in doing so, we were hoping we would provide sort of a belts and braces approach for the diagnosis of invasive fungal disease in the critical care COVID-19 patient. The other thing to look at is that um, the diagnosis of invasive aspergillosis in the ICU, if you compare BTD glucan versus galactamannan, um, this is a relatively small study. But what it actually shows you is that if you look at serum galactamannan outside of the neutropenic hematology patient, you'll find that sensitivity is generally quite low. Now, I know for inv invasive aspergillosis post-influenza, they have seen higher rates of around sort of 60%, 50 to 60% sensitivity. In my experience, serum galactamine and outside of the neutropenic patient is generally very, very poor and sensitivity is somewhere around that 20 to 40% mark. If you, if in the situation where you do a galactamine and testing on a BAL specimen, sensitivity is high, irrespective of the underlying condition, and you're going to get around that 92% sensitivity. 
beta D-glucan testing on serum actually provides you with sensitivity comparable to that of BAL glaxomannan. And you can see that beta D-glucan sensitivity in this study was nigh on 90%. And so it might be that beta D-glucan testing outside of the neutropenic hematology patient is, a, is an alternative for the diagnosis of invasive aspergillosis, providing you combine it with other mycological tests. So this is an evaluation of mycology in COVID-19 associated pulmonary aspergillosis or CAPA. It's some work that I've done locally um, from some of the studies that were published early into sort of the, 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 the pandemic itself um, and looked at six studies that had multiple CAPA cases. And I redefined those using a single case definition. It's something that we, a case definition that we propose in our publication published in Clinical Infectious Diseases last year. And so subsequently we had 68 cases of CAPA. I then wanted to just look at what tests were available across the studies um, and in doing so identified respiratory culture, galactamanin on, and aspergillus PCR on the respiratory tract, and then galactamanin, aspergillus PCR and beta D-glucan on blood. And what you can see is that, as you'd expect, most centers are used to perform in culture and galactamanin on respiratory tract specimens, some doing aspergillus PCR on the respiratory tract. Um, but when it comes to the blood tests, pretty much, all studies were doing galactamine and ELISA on serum, but very few were doing beta D glucan serum testing. And when it comes to actually down to then the breakdown of test performance in, the, in, in terms of detection of CAPA, you can see that no single test actually picks up all cases. Respiratory culture, galactamine and ELISA, and aspergillus PCR on the respiratory tract, providing you with a sort of a moderate sensitivity uh, with GM and aspergillus providing you with sort of the best sensitivity. Um, and in my experience, culture here is performing quite well at a, at a sensitivity of around 65%, because normally we would expect, in my experience, culture from the respiratory tract of a patient with invasive aspergillosis sensitivity can be as low as 20%. If you look at blood galactamine and, and blood aspergillus PCR, you can see a poor sensitivity around 10 to 20%, whereas serum beta D glucan in this setting is providing us with a sensitivity that's comparable to what we'd expect from our biomarkers and mycology from samples from the respiratory tract. So we put forward the combination testing is beneficial, likely serum beta D glucan with respiratory tract testing. And that while blood testing with aspergillus PCR and galactamannan is of limited sensitivity, it probably gives you a, a high specificity for diagnosis. So we then performed a study to look at the performance of the STAT assay with the idea that it could then be used going through the pandemic, through the, the additional waves of COVID-19, that this assay could be tested in other centres. And so we performed a retrospective evaluation of critical care COVID-19 patients uh, with or without secondary invasive fungal disease. So it was a retrospective case control study. Um, samples were originally sent for fungital testing um, as part of routine. They were tested in duplicate and all samples had a coefficient of variation of less than 20%. Samples were selected on their BD, initial BDG concentration. And this was blinded to the case definition in regards to fungal disease. But obviously somebody that generally has a positive or a high beta D-glucan concentration has a high op chance of having invasive fungal disease in somebody who's negative. But we had a wide, specif wide range of specimens, as you can see highlighted uh, below. Invasive fungal disease was proposed, uh, was, was defined as using consensus definitions in terms of the yeast infections. It was just recovery of a positive blood culture or culture from a sterile site. But in terms of invasive aspergillosis, we used the recent, recent ISHAM ECMM guidelines um, to describe CAPA. The study was supported by the Associates of Cape Cod through the provision of kits, but data analysis was completely independent of ACC. So what did we find? We, well, we tested 100 patients and 107 samples, and we had 43 cases of invasive fungal disease, 28 cases of CAPA, 17 probable, 11 possible, uh, 11 yeast infections, including one rhodotrol fungemia and one unidentified uh, yeast infection from a sterile site. And we had 49 control patients. And so in that breakdown, you can see that just from quickly looking at this table, and so this paper is now published in JCLIN Microbiology, and you can see that overall performance in terms of breakdown of positivity across the actual patient cohort is similar for both the fungital and the STAT assay. In terms of STAT positivity, uh, positivity rates were greatest in 
or significantly greater in patients with fungal disease defined, such as the probable or possible kappa um, and yeast infections, compared to patients who had a candida line infection, which can be a complication, but is not necessarily uh, an invasive fungal disease per se, and particularly greater than those that had uh, no evidence of fungal disease, where positivity was only 6%. So argument, you know, we're not generating a huge degree of false positivity um, in this case control study. Median beta-glucan indexes were greater in patients with invasive fungal disease, as you'd expect, significantly higher values than those with line infections or no evidence of fungal infection. In terms of concordance between STATS and the original Fungitel assay, we had really good concordance, 97%, um, 103 out of 106 samples. One sample was excluded because of uh, interference on both tests, um, generating a kappa statistic of 0.94. Of the discordant results, there was uh, two fungital weekly positive that was stat indeterminate and one fungital uh, indeterminate that was stat negative. In terms of quantitative agreement, you can see from the it was, it was a significant Spearman's coefficient, uh, 0 .9, just around 0 0.9, so a, a good to excellent or very good to excellent sort of Spearman's coefficient. And what we actually then did is we used the line of the curve to back calculate uh, stat BDG. BDG concentrations. And while this indicated again a very good agreement with minimal bias between the sort of the, the beta D glucan concentrations, what it actually did is that it overcame this problem because all these samples became positive. But I think there was a further nine samples that were then discordant with the original BTD glucan result as by Fungital. And so the overall uh, qual qualitative agreement actually dropped to 89%. In terms of clinical performance, you can see that sensitivity ranges between sort of 64, 65% to around 70%, so slightly lower um, than what we were seeing from Jurgen's study. But we have to bear in mind here that kappa is likely less invasive than what we would see in aspergillosis in, say, a neutropenic patient. So we're in the situation that we might have less biomarkers in the blood. Uh, compared to, say, a hematology patient with invasive aspergillosis. Um, and sort of in relation to candidemia, we are around the 80% mark, which is where we would expect to see from meta-analyses of beta glucan um, in, this, in this patient population. And so where you're really looking at was this situation that because of sort of the high specificity at 94%, we had a really good positive likelihood ratio greater than 10. Um, and this would be the situation that a statistician would tell you, if your positive likelihood ratio is greater than 10, then your patient does have invasive fungal disease. However, if you look at the incidence, say an instance of invasive candidiasis or an instance of invasive aspergillosis of around 6%, um, then you actually find the positive predictive values is still less than 50%. So arguably you can have to combine this with other biomarker tests. And the negative predictive value, even with this sort of sensitivity around sort of that 70% mark, um, still is around 98%. And so, as you mentioned, you may well, performance is identical to the original Fungital. And actually, you know, stat sensitivity was superior to serum galactamanin testing, which is also limited to invasive aspergillosis, whereas here we're picking up candidemias as well. And of course, repeat testing or sequential testing with fob glucan does improve the actual specificity. In terms of clinical performance moving on is can we improve it? And the one thing you might have seen from the slide before was that if we considered indeterminates as positive, while it did slightly increase sensitivity, that improvement in sensitivity was offset by a decrease in specificity. So subsequently, um, think lowering the threshold to in include indeterminates as positive wasn't actually beneficial. So we performed rock, performed rock analysis, and here we have um, proven probable aspergillosis and candidosis, and proven probable aspergillosis, candidosis, and other forms of proven fungal disease. And you can see that the area in the curve is again similar to what Jürgen presented. And what we actually found was that uh, the threshold, the BGI threshold, lowering it from the sort of the previous sort of 1.2 mark to around the sort of a 0 0.9, actually increased sensitivity in line with using the indeterminates threshold previous, but actually maintain specificity as if we used the higher threshold. So it actually improved performance slightly. Using a BD glucan index of around greater than 2.9 generated 100% specificity, but we were unable to generate a beta glucan index that would generate a 100% sensitivity. So in conclusion, 
Stat is a simple to perform test with minimal hands-on time and generating results um, in a rapid nature allows low throughput testing of between one and seven specimens. So that allows it to be performed outside specialist centers uh, and obviously performs, allows us then to get, you know, results back from urgent samples, which I think given sort of the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic and the critical care nature of, our, of those patients, it's no good having a, you know, a BTD glucan result back in sort of 96 hours. Performance is comparable to the fungital assay, which is good. Um, and that, you know, there's good quantitative agreement in that the beta glucan in index is generally proportional to, to the uh, concentration generated in picograms per by the fungital assay. Excellent qualitative agreement. Discrepancies were minor. And though, although we could sort of lower the beta the glucan index, it does slightly improve performance. I think we need to sort of enhance that by the, with further studies and really like with any BTC glucan, we need to combine this test with other biomarkers and other mycology. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Louis, for an excellent presentation. Um, we've reached the hour and many of us will probably jump into the next meeting. So I'm, for example, jumping into a meeting for Tim. I mean, Everdeen, which yeah. um, will start next week and will be in person. So I'm very much looking forward to meet many of you there. But nevertheless, I think we should take the time. There's one question and we should take our time to answer this. And the question is actually um, from Jürgen. So what he's asking specifically, what was the control group in your study, um, given the specificity of 94%, um, which seems quite high for the ICU um, when we think about, you know, correlation of serum beta glucan with sepsis scores, et cetera. Yeah. So the, the control cohort was our critical care COVID-19 patient. Mm -hmm. And, and to be honest, you know, when we started doing beta glucan testing, we expected quite a lot of false positivity. But, you know, overall, I think in, of uh, the number of samples we've tested, I would say less than 10% of our samples are beta D glucan positive. And we're getting a lot of sequential positivity indicating that these are not false positive results. So I think because we're not getting high numbers of false positive beta D glucans with a fungi tail test in our hands, because of our sample selection criteria, which was selection based on original beta glucan concentration, we then got some selection bias, so the specificity is reading higher than what you would normally expect. But yeah, we we locally don't generally have a major problem with false positive beta glucans, and I do wonder if it's because all our sort of biomedical scientists are trained to perform molecular tests. And so subsequently doing the glucan, there's no sort of problems in terms of false positivity from a technical perspective. Of course, from the clinical perspective, as Jürgen has alluded to, you can't do anything about that. If it's in the specimen, it's in the specimen. But we just didn't see any in the COVID-19 critical care patient or minimal false positivity. Thank you so much. Thanks. So excellent symposium. Um, fantastic speakers with Louis and Jürgen. And thanks very much for your attention and for your discussion. And I think in 15 or 12 minutes now, um, the next poster session will start um, for the MOOC meeting. So thanks a lot. And thanks, of course, last but not least to the sponsor of this session, um, Cape Cod Diagnostics, um, including Malcolm Finkelman, who is in the audience. Thank you. <laughs>